Hey y'all, welcome to Season 2 of Corax and Coffee Cast. I'm your host, Pete Steele. And I'm your other host, Rick Hendricks. And this is where we are all about bringing new people into the hobby of tabletop gaming. And we're all about pushing back hard against the stereotype that board gamers and nerds are asocial beings. So before we get into it, we do want to give a shout out to our behind the scenes people, being our producer, Keegan King, our editor of all things, Sarah Vasa, and our board game enthusiast consultant, Miss Shaw. Speaking of getting into it, we're going to talk today a little bit about the different ways that you can role play. We're going to talk first about the mathematical frameworks in role playing games, and then we're going to shift from there into some math heavy games. We're going to talk about Shadowrun, Eclipse Phase, and then we're going to have a heavy focus on Dungeons and Dragons. To be clear, though, we're not going to talk about hardcore math in any of that. We're just going to talk about these games as math heavy games. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you won't have any difficulty following that. So once we're done with talking about these math heavy or crunchy games, we're going to get into story and narrative heavy games. So we're going to talk briefly about monsters and other childish things, the burning wheel, and then we're going to get heavy into fate. Oh, I do love me some fate. It's so versatile. And then we're going to get into some games that you can play if you have very little time. So these are pickup games, mostly uh, micro RPGs. So let's talk a little bit about maths and mathematical structure for role-playing games. There are so many pencil and paper role-playing games. There are single sheet games, there are pull out of your head narrative games, and there's absolutely everything in between. And if there isn't yet, they're making new ones. Right. Yeah, some of these are incredibly rules heavy and crunchy. They have lots of numbers. And there are some others which seemingly have no math, and that's not quite true, but it's as close as we can get. Well, I actually often say that there's nothing without math. There's no anything at all without math. I mean, math basically underlies everything from role playing to the simplest cognitions and everything simpler than that, which is actually many, many things. It's there, even if you don't pay attention to it or understand it. Right. You could say there are no role playing games at all without maths. And for anyone who's thinking, oh my goodness, Pete doesn't know what he's talking about, I can do no math, I'd say to you, you're actually probably also thinking in your head, holy shoot, how long is he going to talk about how much math is important to everything? When will he stop that and you're doing some mental math of your own? Mental, mental math about how long you've been listening, how long you have to listen to this nonsense. Speaking of which, buckle up, it's going to be a while. It's, gonna, it's not going to be that long a while. <laughs> So yeah, there's, there's, there's no role playing without math or games in general. Uh, this is true. In fact, I remember when my algebra teacher, Todd Shively, would say, he, he would say, there's no guessing in math. There's no guessing. No guessing. Taking this from A League of Their Own, you know, the movie with Tom Hanks and Gina Davis. Sure, sure. There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Enrico Fermi would disagree, but I digress. About the math of the baseball? Uh, probably about the math. It's a, his whole thing was how far you can get without having any actual concrete numbers. Right. I do understand his point, both Enrico Fermi's and Todd Shively's, but I'm actually talking about Todd Shively. The great luminary of a time, yes. If you will. <laughs> Hi, Todd Shively. <laughs> this is a shout out to you. I hope you're doing well. I think we're actually friends on Facebook. Who knows? But if I could go back to adolescent algebra and that classroom. Why would you want to? Be better uses for time travel, Pete. <laughs> I would say to my teacher, I'd say, Todd, uh, right, Mr. Shively. <laughs> I'd say, Mr. Shively, I don't know about it. There's no guessing in math. I don't know about that thing you kept saying. You clearly haven't played very many pencil and paper role playing games. Yeah, you can fudge the math and you can guess at math all the time. And in fact, that's kind of encouraged. It moves things along sometimes. It is okay. It is okay. I think a lot of times it needs to be encouraged. But I was also always one to challenge my teachers and professors. Sometimes it worked out better than others. Anyway, the amount of guessing and fudging you do with the numbers in a given RPG system is really largely up to the group of people you're playing with which is actually really quite cool. You have a lot of flexibility. Yeah, you could fairly easily, depending on your game system, modify the number of statistically based decisions you want to make based on the play style that you and the others players want. 
You can change the amount of direct mathematical structure that you want within the confines of the game you're playing. And sometimes that can be really great, and we're going to talk about that later. But there are also other frameworks. You can build a muscle car inside a Volkswagen Beetle, I guess. But you could also just start with a muscle car. So sometimes you find you're doing more work to change it into something it's not supposed to be, if that makes any sense. I totally want to do the Volkswagen Beagle thing. Can we go do that, like, right now? Uh, maybe after this. So let's talk about some crunchy RPGs. Sure. Math heavy. Let's start with Shadowrun. Oh, yeah. In this RPG world, magic is real, and so is advanced technology. And this system, this world, kind of combines these the, these things together, you know, the scientific and the fantastic. And it measures how much you're beholden to each world. I think if you use too, te- too much technology, you can lose parts of your soul. And Right. And I'm sure, you know, that was really stolen from George Lucas, who probably stole it from somebody else, let's be real. But in Shadowrun, corporations are run by dragons who can actually own people. You know, you've got you've got hacking and body modification, yeah. which impacts your soul in various ways. And it's really this push pull of who do you want to be and how can you augment your body and how can you dive into the world of magic to kind of alleviate your body modification in some ways, kind of depending on the type of character you want to be. Numbers, numbers, numbers and tables and roles really dictate this system in a very, very deterministic way. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of fun stuff here, too. You know, you. It's a great excuse to have a uh, troll sitting at the bar drinking a cup of coffee. But, yeah, lot, very rule-heavy. It is. And that's great for some people. I've enjoyed playing Shadowrun, but it's definitely not the RPG that I've stuck with. Everyone has limited time, right? And if I were stranded on a desert island and had all the time in the world to play RPGs with, I suppose, myself and a volleyball, I guess, I don't know. Sure. I might play Shadowrun. But given the limited amount of time in my life right now, if I were going to play one RPG, for me, it would not be Shadowrun. Not because I don't like the world, but because of how math-heavy and rules-heavy it is. And to really experience most of that world, you have to know most of those rules. Sure. And you have to keep them in your head. Right. So another very fun but very math-heavy world is the world of Eclipse Face. Mm, yeah. Eclipse Phase is a starfaring game about transhumanism. It's got artificial immortality and digital immortality. So you can die and have your soul beamed off to your new body. How does he, how does this game differentiate between artificial and digital immortality? Basically, if you've still got your brain mm-hmm. and your brain is still made of meat, mm-hmm. then you can build a whole bunch of things around it. And you can move into a different body. You can re-sleeve. That's fine. As soon as you go all digital, all mechanical, you then become an AI, maybe based on a person who once existed. But it does have some dramatic effects about what you're vulnerable to and et cetera. So it's a difference between Darth Vader and Durandell. Sure. Yeah. It talks about a, a deserted, dangerous Earth where everybody just ran away after the fall. It's got evil alien computer viruses. And Shadowrun dips a little bit into body modification, but if you really want to go far down that rapid hole, Eclipse Phase is where you want to be. You can print yourself a new body on Mars from wherever you are now. You can add extra legs and a cannon in the chest. So really, this is the not-too-distant future. Possibly? I mean, as soon as I can 3D print myself a chest cannon, I'm doing it. I'm going to be, like, first in line for that. This is fair. You can also alter the way your brain perceives things, which is uh, clearly very dangerous. Because if you reprogram yourself poorly, you might not be smart enough to reprogram yourself back. But, you know, that's fine. That's why you back yourself up, right? So what, what happens if you meet a backup of yourself? You hire a really good lawyer. I mean, I would be interested to talk to a theory of mind philosopher about that, actually. Like, if you can do digital backups of yourself and you meet yourself, what happens? That actually, I'm, I'm sure they talk about that sort of thing all the time, but I digress. So anyway, both very math-heavy games. But the one math-heavy game everybody knows and talks about is Dungeons & Dragons by Wizards of the Coast. And uh, if you are 
a nerd and you've only played one role playing game, it's likely to be D and D. It's a game that comes with its own assumed setting. There are dungeons, there are dragons. Undead are powered by their mystical connection to the negative energy plane. You can buy a bag of holding in a shop for between about uh, 101 and 500 gold pieces, uh, depending on where you're buying it and how well the shopkeeper likes you. I actually remember playing a character who dealt in black and gray market bags of holding. And uh, he even had a bag of holding just to store all of the bodies that piled up. It was awesome. Yeah. Nowadays, they've got bags of devouring that just eat anything that's placed in them. That's basically made for that. It's like, ooh, let me put all of the evidence of my crimes in here. Yeah, where do I get one of those? In D&D, everything about the game has been defined for you, from the stats of the monsters to the available classes to how much damage your spear does. It's a widely known game. It's pretty easy to find people to play with, and it comes with a rich world pre-built for you. Your new kingdom and adventure can fit very easily into the corners of this wider world, provided that your story is one that follows the assumed rules. And there's tons and tons of source material, Mm -hmm. decades of source material. There's a lot of freedom in D&D, but freedom has to be attained in one of three ways. Either you know about the obscure prestige class or feat, which allows you to do what you want to do, or you homebrew your own stuff using a fair amount of math, which fits in with the rest of the game balance-wise and flavor-wise. Or you change the flavor of something in a way that doesn't matter. You know, I don't actually want to be using a hand axe. I want to be using a, a mimic that's, you know, just going to gobble things I swing at. But it uses hand axe stats. Nothing is really stopping you from homebrewing D&D so far that you get to set it in Andy's bedroom from Toy Story. But the game system will fight you every step of the way. Everything will need to be redefined. The bleeding out rules won't make any sense for plastic toys. You'd have to reskin the Tarrasque to try and approximate the family dog. And you're probably not going to be able to allow any spellcasting classes. I can't see how you would manage it. Rick, so I have to say... I. I appreciate the perspective, but I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I think that you can pick up D&D books, grab some dice, say, hey, you're in Andy's bedroom, you know, you're dressed as cowboy, what do you do? Go. You chuck some dice and you can actually just say, oh, I have the spear. Oh, you know, I'm going to use those numbers from that spear that's in, you know, the player's guide and I'm going to roll some dice and have a great time. I think it's important to to mention that, yes, the D&D system will fight players to some extent, but relative to other systems like Fate. It's not like, if you want to have more freedom, don't do D&D. If you have D&D books or want to use D&D but want more freedom, go for it. Absolutely. It works. It does. Yeah. Carve off the parts you don't like, add other things, and if it doesn't end up particularly balanced at the end, eh, you're still going to have a lot of fun. I mean, I think you are. Yeah. I think, I think too, you know, the setting of Andy's bedroom is the perfect setting for laser sharking. Sure. Right? I mean, even if it doesn't work in other settings, you know, laser sharking being where you grab two things from different worlds and slap them together with the idea of being cool and ends up being not as cool. In an Andy's bedroom setting, laser sharking isn't really laser sharking because it works. Because right. lasers, sharks with lasers are awesome. And you can grab a toy from any tv show that exists in that world and it just makes as much sense as woody the cowboy right exactly yeah um and i think kind of laser sharking in way in a way that works was kind of the main subtext component of the toy story franchise anyway although Mm -hmm. that might be Anachronistic. I don't know, you know, the term laser sharking comes from Austin Powers, so I don't know if applying that term to Toy Story is anachronistic or not. It probably is. Mm. But the concept remains. Sure. And I think it's important to point out, though, yes, D&D is currently owned by Wizards of the Coast, but twas not always so. And I actually know some D&D purists who are, you know, TSR purists who will only play D&D modules that were actually put out and published by TSR when the company was owned by TSR. So that gives them source material through circa 1992, 95. I can't remember exactly when the 
the IP changed hands. But D&D has been around for so long, you know, since the 70s. It has gone through many, many iterations and different company holdings, which has developed the game and advanced the game in many ways and put it into the hands of uh, many, many more people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of more people. But it's also a very different game in some very good ways and in some ways that, you know, like I miss, I miss AD&D 2.0. Mm-hmm. Well, the good news is it's still here. No. And there's no shortage of homebrewed stuff that's available for free or, you know, for purchase. And you can definitely play a lot of D&D without giving Wizards of the Coast any money. I actually remember when I was playing my first or second D&D campaign, which was 2.0, you know, second edition. And this is like a year after my cousins had taught it to me, and I brought my character sheets to them. And there was one whole top section with different percentiles and things like this, which is not filled out. And they said, where's all this information? I'm like, oh, I don't understand what this box of percentiles even does. I don't I don't use that. And they looked at me like I was, I, I don't know, a horrible evil lich or something like that. I don't know, because my cousin just looked at me and said, this information is critical. You have to have this. Right. You're not even playing D&D if you don't have these percentages filled out. Right. You know, that like which is his point. And I didn't have the the verbal skills to kind of combat his statement at the time, but you know, if I were to have that same conversation with him now, it's like clearly not as critical as you think because my friends and I have been playing D&D without this information and been having a grand old time. Clearly not using all of the maths and the rules that 2.0 said we needed to but sure any D &D enthusiast would also say you don't you don't need this so it it is definitely your group's choice right exactly the point here is for D D and any of these math heavy rpgs is really your option you can play with less crunch and math and still have a great time definitely agreed so speaking of bringing disparate ideas together uh, if you want to play D&D, but you want to play it in a different setting, you can try out Urban Arcana, which is powered by the D&D system. And it's set on Earth, where magic and monsters exist, but they're unknown to most. It's got sort of that perception filter thing, where if you aren't already in the know, you'll miss the fireball that just zinged past your head. An elite class with secret knowledge who are in the know... Or other people are just mindless drones walking by. Hey, look, it's self-insert fantasy fulfillment, right? Speaking of fantasy fulfillment, that's a perfect transition, or not at all. No, but seriously, speaking of fantasy fulfillment, I actually want to talk about some kind of homebrew role-playing games that... I played as a little kid that really brought me into this hobby. And I mention them because, you know, these are homebrew systems that still used some math and grabbed some math from some other systems, but definitely used far less math than some of these crunchy systems we were just talking about. And I want to mention my friend Will Leiserson, who I think I've mentioned before in season one or whatever. Yeah, I think he's a friend of the show at this point. Yeah, yeah. A friend of the show without knowing it, right? Right. But... He just had this uncanny ability to create narrative for RPGs on the spot, just immediately. They were typically based in existing science fiction or fantasy IP. I'm sure now that when he would seemingly create something on the spot, he'd been thinking about it for a few days. Yeah, probably. The cool ideas generally live in there rent-free for a while, whenever you're supposed to be doing something else. Yeah, well, that's when you do your best RPG work, right? Absolutely, as an escape from this horrible thing, whatever we're doing. (laughs) <laughs> but Will would just I remember he would just whip out a piece of paper and a pencil and start sketching something and come up with a new game for us to play on the spot uh, he was actually quite a talented sketch artist but after five minutes of drawing up a map of the United Federation of Planets from Star Trek he would have major alpha and beta quadrant powers from the 2260s you know this is the the era of Captain Kirk and Star Trek. Or, but he'd whip up a map with, you know, with the Klingon Empire and the Romulans and the Tholians and the Gorn and the Kazinti, and he would write up, write up on a piece of paper five or six ships that I could buy and ways to upgrade them, and there would be stats and so forth. And he would function as the game master, and I would take on the role of captain or commodore or admiral serving in Starfleet, mm-hmm. and 
just out of his head, he found ways for me to make cultural and economic and technological and strategic decisions based on scenarios that he presented. Uh, we, we definitely played kind of a militaristic expansionist sort of Starfleet. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> but he would, you know, take his eraser to the sketch he had drawn up and erase and redraw lines on the map based on my political and economic and military decisions. And it was awesome that is so cool yeah so you got to live with your own legacy and go forward in time to deal with your own problems that you'd created well, we're still talking about the game right <laughs> oh yes it's much more fun when you're using pencil and paper than when you have to wait out those years <laughs> yeah i mean many of these games he created were fantasy wish fulfillment in the grandest ways mm -hmm. but we played this game you know which is based on starfleet battles if, if people are familiar with those games. But we played this game for dozens and dozens of hours. And Will, after a while, expanded this into a Star Trek RPG and converted it into this granular system where I would started to fly my own individual ship and hire a small crew, and I was really a privateer flying around. But he would sketch out 20 or 30 different ships that could exist in a universe of, of Star Trek. And we'd play this for dozens of hours as well shrinking in scale, getting more personal. It reminds me a little bit about the history of D&D, &D, which came out of wargaming. Right. And then moved into small squads. Right, yeah. It also reminds me a lot of that game Microscope, which is all about designing a world and then talking about the dog who lives on it and then going over here when we're bored of that. I've heard of this game. I've heard of Microscope, but I've never played it. Yeah, I, I think we've talked about it on the podcast, actually. Okay, maybe we have. Maybe we have. But you're talking about D&D &D being scaled down and becoming more granular, having its origins in wargaming, right? Mm -hmm. And Will and I would play our own D&D &D cam campaigns as well. Mm -hmm. And again, he would sketch art. Will actually did a lot of laser sharking in his campaigns. He would pull in characters from other IPs, having them come through interdimensional portals into the fantasy feudal world of D&D. And, you know, right, we've talked about normally laser sharking doesn't really work. It can be tricky to pull off, yeah. It can be very tricky to pull off, but Will just had the knack of just weaving anything into a story arc. So I'd find myself going on a long quest and grinding and building up my powers in order to fight off an evil wizard, which ended up being Darth Vader. <laughs> and it and it worked. It just worked. I know so few people who can actually pull it off in such a fluid and believable way. Yeah. I mean, we all borrow from other places. It's one of the best ways to get fully realized characters quickly. But it can be real difficult to just own that and say, yeah, it's Darth Vader. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it, right? I think he also pulled in the, you know, the, the Space Marine from the Marathon series of Mac computer games, which are actually the forerunner, see what I did there, to the Halo series, um, of all things. But, you know, we also did this same toward, sort of, you know, war game to RPG conversion with Battletech and other things like that. Ah, uh, yeah. And just kind of, you know, took a little bit of the math, but had this huge narrative style. And we're actually going to talk about Battletech and kind of the history of that game in a few episodes. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Before we get there, we're going to talk about story-driven games. Okay. One of the ones that I love and think more people should know about is Monsters and Other Childish Things. This is a game where you're eight and you have a pet monster and the adults don't believe you. The other kids believe you because they can see the pet monster, but none of the adults are in on it. So you play as both the monster and the kids and you try and keep hilarity from ensuing when their priorities clash, which of course they do. So every time I've played Monsters and Other Childish Things... I've actually always made the child the true monster and the monster the voice of morality. It makes a lot of sense, though. Every time I've done this, I think my fellow players wanted to boot me out of the game. It's very easy for a child to have strong feelings on things and not a lot of context to where, yeah, they would do some crazy stuff if they could. Another good story-driven game is The Burning Wheel. Uh, it digs heavily into character backstory beliefs, the relationships between the characters, and there are a bunch of mechanics specifically for those evolving relationships. 
It's it's very heavily story driven, but it also has a lot of rules. So it's not the sort of thing you just want to pick up. This is a game I know you've played, but I've actually never played The Burning Wheel. It's been it's on my list. It's one of those much like Fate, which we'll talk about in a minute, where every game is different because it really matters who your characters are, which direction it ends up going in. And I'm so glad you said that, Rick, because this is actually an issue that I have with so many role playing game systems and worlds is that your character and class and skills tend not to qu- matter quite as much as maybe they should. And I understand a huge reason for that is because you don't want to limit too much what any given character can do because that's not really fun in an open world environment. And I also understand that that issue is really very dependent on the group of people you play with and the game master running your game. I do get that. But I'm so glad to hear that there are systems out there that really emphasize a little bit more emphasis on character class in ways that actually matter rather than just saying, oh, I'm this and I can do whatever and what will be will be. Mm -hmm. Right. And oh, yeah, we've all killed a gelatinous cube and it was the same experience. Like, no. Sometimes your chef needs to turn the gelatinous cube into dessert. Having a different experience from other people can be valuable. So speaking of talking of fate in a minute, let's talk about Fate by Evil Hat Productions. Unlike D&D and a lot of these other games we've talked about, Fate's system is setting neutral. It doesn't have a defined setting, so it has nothing to fight you over, nothing to try and drag you back to. It concerns itself with generic challenges to be overcome, and it actively wants to be reskinned. Once you swap out the drive skill for pedal, you can have your six-year-olds riding bikes instead of driving cars, and it plays just as well. One great thing that I've seen in several Fate games is you can invent the world together in real time as you're playing. So, like, the GM will ask you something about your character. What horrible mistake did you make that changed this world forever, if that's the scale you're playing on? And you answer, and the world changes in response to that. A lot of really fun fake games also haven't fully defined the characters until you start actually playing. It's not like D&D where, at least according to the rules, you have to have, okay, so what's in your pockets? You know, what's your strength score? Blah, 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 blah. You can really just start off fate by saying, I am a rogue gunslinger and my gun skills are amazing. And you can just go from there. And if you want to be good at something later great, you can be good at that. Fate system avoids rigid definitions and numbers. One of the great ways it does that is with the resource skill. In a game like D&D, kings have a set amount of money, like in gold and copper pieces. If you are paying attention to that, you subtract all the expenditures for guards, festivals, you track whether he's got his taxes paid yet, all that stuff. Kings in Fate would just have a high resource skill. They get a bonus to any rolls they make to try and buy their way out of trouble. Now, if, say, you just bought a neighboring kingdom and overextended yourself, you might end up with a consequence called not very liquid right now, which could then be compelled to complicate your attempt to use that skill in future. Using this type of type of system reminds me of, oh, I can't remember which recent DC movie this was. I think it might have been Justice League, which I know I'm probably going to attract some haters for even mentioning that movie. But I remember Barry Allen asks Bruce Wayne, it's like, what's your superpower? And Bruce Wayne just says, I'm rich. And that's what it is, right? Bruce Wayne doesn't worry about buying a pizza or a car or even a private jet for that matter. Like he just, you know, he has money and he buys what, what the Justice League needs. That's kind of like his superpower. Maybe not in the end of the Chris Nolan Batman franchise, but you get the idea. Absolutely. And, you know, Batman buys whatever he wants. Spider-Man does have to worry about buying a pizza. He saves up for two weeks to buy a pizza. Or he steals a pizza because he's just not going to be able to afford it. And that's one great thing about Fate is you can focus more on who these characters are than what gear they have particularly. You can just 
pull random things out of your pocket because they are they fit well with the character and it doesn't matter because mechanically they don't change anything it's just oh yeah this is the sort of thing that he would carry with him so i do worry about systems like fate with certain groups of people mm. i mean if you if you're having fun playing fate you're playing fate right mm-hmm. But what I have experienced in playing Fate with less experienced gamers is power creep to the max. In that, in order to make something more exciting, you're like, oh, I could jump five feet before, but now I can jump 20 feet. It's like, oh, I could jump 20 feet before, and now I can jump 50 feet, right? Your power keeps creeping up and up and up. And without a more rigid mathematical framework to help limit that, um, things can spiral out of control pretty seriously. And... Mm-hmm. The reason that's a problem is that once you can jump 10,000 feet in the air, things aren't very complicated or difficult for you anymore. You know, like insert the dilemma and ability here. Sure. But that's not that's not fun or exciting or interesting anymore because there's no challenge. Now, you can have the same type of power creep with any heavier math-based RPG system, and I've seen that as well. There's always an excuse to cram more power in. There's always an excuse to cram more power in to make things more exciting in the short term. It's a sh- short term payoff, long term problem. And this is just my experience, but I have experienced this being more of a problem in systems like Fate, where you know you don't have as much of a framework to prevent that from happening. But other people might have very different experiences. In some of the better Fate games that I've experienced, you find that characters don't tend to grow so much in power they change there tends to be more oh i got injured in this traumatic fight and i got that part of my body you know replaced with machinery or you know i got a magical spell to help me deal with that and now i am really good at being spooky because i'm half undead but i'm also vulnerable to this that that it's a game that ideally you should approach not trying to get to to raise the amount of power that you have, but trying to be more and more this character you're trying to portray. It's really a game that's meant for groups and players who are invested in developing not only the collective narrative, but also the intentions and motivations and narrative of their own characters. It's true. So in Fate, luck is a lot less important. Instead of using a d20 like you would in D&D, you use four Fate dice. Now, Fate dice are six-sided dice with pluses and minuses on them in equal proportion. So you roll these four dice and you add them to your skill roll. Your rolled skills are going to cleave pretty closely to your level of training. But that's when you get to throw on Aspects. Now, aspects are a really important part of this game that we'll cover in a little bit. But aspects can give a plus or minus two, and you have to use a fate point every time to use one. That plus two can have a lot of weight when the numbers and dice are small, especially if you're doing something so in your lane that more than one aspect applies here. So let's talk a little bit about aspects. Your character might have an aspect or a high concept called Rock and Roll Legend, which helps you out in rock star situations. I mean, everyone wants that, right? Absolutely. Now, the thing is, what is a rock star situation? (laughs) Oh, there are a few things that come to mind. So it's, it's more or less your job to argue that being a rock and roll legend should give you an advantage at trying to, I don't know, impress a groupie or actually perform at your show. Or avoid consequences for sneaking a goat into the hotel? I mean, that's that's the only reason I ever wanted to be a rock star was for the, the, the hotel goat sneaking thing. The hotel goat sneaking, yeah. And also just, you know, like throwing a TV out the window. Like, why not? Yeah, exactly. Wanted destruction of somebody else's property. And, and when you've wantonly destructed somebody else's property, maybe you don't actually have any resources. But uh, come on, I'm a rock star. I'm good for it. <laughs> And then, you know, when they believe you for a minute, you sneak out the back, right? If the DM agrees, you'd spend a fate point to activate your rock star ability. And then you'd get a plus two on the roll. Or possibly if you just rolled like absolute garbage, you could re-roll. 
Or, you know, you can, you know, you can pay the hotel manager back and but also laugh about it. Be like, hey, you give them ten thousand dollars up front and be like, this is for damages. And you throw a TV out the window and then they laugh about it. Then you have a story. Be like, hey, I threw a TV about out this guy's window and he laughed. It was awesome. And then we had beers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's tr- there's true fantasy wish fulfillment. Forget about storming the castle. Like, this is where it's at. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm making it too real. Well, I mean, the, the great thing is if you want to be in that sort of a story, in fate, you can just go ahead and do that. I think I think you just hit the nail on the head, Rick. It's, you know, <laughs> if you want to be part of that story or involved in that story, what does that say about you? Well, hopefully, I'm, I'm giving I'm giving myself a hard time. Hopefully, your DM will understand what that says about you. And there's this subtle bit where your DM says, "Oh, okay, so that's the story we're playing now." Right. It allows for a lot of improvisation, but it also places a lot of weight on the GM and the group of players. You've got to have a group that can roll with the punches, that can yes and like there's no tomorrow. You've got to have somebody, a group that stays fluid and keeps moving. It seems to me also that a system like Fate kind of thrives more, I don't know if I want to say softer skills, maybe that's not quite right, but, you know, some, you know, having very specific skills that you know you're great at can be helpful, but also it's going to behoove you to have more generic skills that allow for more improvisation in some ways. Mm -hmm. And again, I keep coming back to this, I know, but it really depends on the GM you're playing with and the group of players. But if you're really good at shoving a thousand Tic Tacs in your mouth and still negotiating the best price on an Uber, listeners, do not do that. Do not start a thousand Tic Tac in your mouth challenge. Don't do it. I mean, it'd be really good for ratings. But would it? I mean, I know they say... I mean, couldn't hurt. Uh, It could hurt somebody. (laughs) Yeah, don't do that. Don't put a thousand Tic Tacs in your mouth. Um, Unless they're the orange ones. The orange ones are delicious. Okay, fine. Moving on. Yeah, I think we were going somewhere. We're we're going somewhere with that. (laughs) You know, you might be really good at the Tic Tac challenge, whatever that gets you at the county fair. I don't even know. But the places where that is applicable are going to be fewer and farther between than being good at something like, you know, boosting cars. Or, you know, you could, you know, you know, being good at boosting cars and being really, really, really good at boosting 2006 Subarus. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, unless you just want to add the commanding value of 2006 Subarus being everywhere, like the more generic skill is going to be more useful, right? But uh, eh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. So in addition to your high concept, your awesome, this is what I am high concept, you have something called a trouble aspect that you get to pick. So your superhero's trouble aspect, don't know my own strength, should occasionally bring problems into your life, like having to fix the bridge you twisted up during the fight or making you a terrible choice for performing bomb defusal. The DM might compel this aspect to have you snap the artifact you were supposed to be holding on to in two and make a plot point and if you accept that trouble you'd gain a fate point which you can then spend later to do powerful amazing things now if you refuse to accept that trouble and had a fate puts point saved up you could spend your fate point and forgo the one you would have already gotten to say no no i didn't i was really careful this time and the artifact is fine so aspects can work both ways and uh, you can actually use your trouble aspect for your own good, too, if you can argue. Okay. Don't know my own strength might be really good if you were in an arm wrestling match, for example. Right. You were talking earlier about how having specific skills could kind of hurt you when it comes to improvisation. I, I had forgotten about this part of Fate. It looks like they really tried to address that. They sure did. Another thing that you get to do in Fate is come up with stunts. So let's say you're a computer engineer and you have this unique stunt, backwards compatible. Now, backwards compatible might give you an advantage while trying to spend resources on tech, but be completely useless when shopping for food or a taxi to get out of here. Right. And it changes up your character in a unique way. Sure, you're, you're good at buying stuff, but you're only good at buying computer parts because you can use any old junk to do the job. 
Mm-hmm. So instead of buying a new graphics card, you're buying a uh, remote control drone and you're taking that apart for the part you need. So the other thing you can do for stunts is you can use skills in places they don't normally apply. Like you could have a stunt that allows you to use your fight skill to negotiate if you could argue that that was thematically appropriate. Like, for example, say you're talking to your uh, your gym buddies. Well, okay, you use your fight or your athletic skill to get a certain amount of social clout in that situation, and then you're able to use that to negotiate with. This is the whole Bruce Lee fight scene in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I know it's a very controversial scene in some ways, mm-hmm. but that's just what's coming to mind when you're talking about this. E- exactly, exactly. And it lets you be that awesome punchy guy who also has exactly the right words to say or the right thing to do at the critical moment. So you don't have to choose between being a skill monkey and being a powerful fighter. Sometimes they're the same thing. Another great thing about fate is the world itself can have aspects. Some of these might be permanent aspects, like a zombie world might have death is not the end and scarcity after the fall, which could be invoked or compelled by anyone at the table. But you can also have scene aspects like dark, you know, which might give you an advantage if you're trying to hide. In Fate, straight failure is pretty uncommon. You can succeed with style or you can succeed with consequences. I have seen some pretty hilarious epic failure with style, maybe, in Fate. I don't remember all the details, but I remember playing, and there's something about building, you know, a James Bond villain super fortress on Catalina Island off the coast of L.A., and the whole thing sunk into the ocean because they were, you know, building the fortress too far down or something like that. I don't remember. I don't know. Maybe this is Fate. Maybe this is just based on a nightmare I had. I don't know. Forget about that. Maybe... You're attempting to muscle your way to the lever. And this is a lever that must be pressed. It's got to go at the right time for the plan to work. Push the big red button. Push the big red button. Exactly. So maybe you get there and it was a rousing success. And you're just laughing over your pinned enemy as you pull this lever with your free hand. But maybe you rolled really poorly. But we need you to succeed anyway. Well, okay, in that case, we'd let you succeed with consequence. So in this case, you'd be the one who's been tackled. And you're only able to kick the lever into place while you get socked in the jaw by the person who's holding you down. Or maybe the guard doesn't believe you're supposed to be here, but you kind of lucked out and they're willing to look the other way for a price. This is something that's done often in other RPGs. It's certainly done in D&D, where, oh, well, somebody... They obviously have to find their way into the castle, right? I don't even know why I made them roll for that. Right. But it is, there's rules for it in Fate to keep the plot moving forward in a way that doesn't feel like the result didn't matter. Right. Right. Which I think is actually kind of one of the best parts of Fate, most ingenious parts of Fate in the Fate system. Something that's worth stealing, probably. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Because there's a different, big difference between oh, that didn't work, and oh, that totally worked, but now you're cornered by the guards and the rest of them will have to rescue you. Right. So Fate's choices tend to be lighter on the math than D&D or Pathfinder, but they drip with story. You don't need to have a class or a feat that lets you pull off what you want to do. You don't have to find something that somebody else has already created. You can just dream it and eyeball it, and assuming everybody agrees, you can make it so. Just like life. Just like life. Plus or minus. In Fate, the DM and players pass control of the story back and forth. They use Fate points to bribe for story control. And the more you play along with the other side, the more you get to play with those Fate points. There are a bunch of these that have already been created in their own worlds if you want to explore those. A couple games powered by Fate are Spirit of the Century, which is a pulp setting with mad science, magic, sentient gorillas there's diaspora which is hard sci-fi and there's houses of the blood which is about the social courtly and romantic adventures in a fantasy world i want to see diaspora and houses of the blood laser sharked that would be awesome well 
get to writing. <laughs> We've been talking about crunchy math-driven games and narrative story-driven games as completely separate camps. And it's really not so. I agree. You can really decide what kind of mathematical decision-making framework you want to use. And you can actually change it with the same game system in different contexts, depending on what suits your needs and the needs of your gaming group and what you, what you want to do. I kind of love skill challenges in D&D for this reason, because it feels like they stapled a bit of fate into D&D already. If you want to have a crazy wild chase through the woods, the combat system really isn't good for that. No, not at all. Like, oh, I move 30 feet. I move 40 feet. I move 50 feet. No. Have an awesome action scene where the artificer burns the woods down and the ranger finds you a deer path. Just go nuts with it. Uh, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty later when we actually care. And the more you're able to switch between the nitty gritty mathematical system and kind of a more narrative flow, the more power and opportunity you're going to have to maximize playing things in different settings, regardless of where you are, as well as who happens to be at game group that day and what they prefer and so on and so forth. So rather than rolling dice and using combat tables and insisting your character sheets are with you at all the times, although, I mean, if you put them on your phones or in Google Drive you and use dice rolling apps, you could have them with you at all times. You could also just play a whole scene without rules. You play a whole scene without rules. An amusing day at the flare plot can just allow the wizard to cast without spell slots. It doesn't matter. If you know the characters well enough, you can just vamp for a bit. I'm actually going to tell you that before the advent of Google Docs and smartphones or any of that nonsense, and I am going to date myself here, I was playing role-playing games while waiting in line at a roller coaster park with my cousins. During my childhood and adolescence, my family spent a few weeks every summer vacationing with extended family, cousins, uncles, aunts, on Lake Erie in Ohio, of all places. And my cousins and I would spend a lot of time kind of like, you know, biking around and doing all these things. I mean, it was the 80s and 90s. We could go out on bikes, kids on bikes, and it was cool. Different time. Um, but in the evenings, we would play a lot of D&D. &D. But typically, while on vacation every year, one, for one day, we'd go to Cedar Point, which is a roller coaster park in Ohio. And so my cousins and I would find ourselves standing in line for hours waiting to get on a ride. And we would people watch a little bit. But after that, what do you to do but go back to your D&D &D campaign? So we would come up with semi-reasonable odd systems based on dice rolls or close approximations. You know, pick a number between 1 and 10 or 1 and 20 or rock, paper, scissors or whatever. Odds and evens. It didn't matter. We had a couple other systems, but I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. And, or we just role play it out. And then we would go back to the game table that night and switch back to the dice rolling system. But our characters had progressed so far in the game because we were able to kind of just spin on a dime the mathematical framework work that we used. Yeah, our LARP works kind of like this. On the actual days we're LARPing, there are a bunch of rules, there's the weapons, all this, all this jazz. But between games, you have this whole other game of shared secrets, plots, conducted over email, conducted over messenger. We've even done some play-by-post role-play on Facebook posts. And it's just a great time to get done some of those conversations you don't have time for during the actual game. Right. And if you're willing to be flexible in these ways in terms of how your odds are calculated, if they're calculated at all, and kind of the form in which you play in person versus Facebook versus a text group chat or you know email or whatever you want to do, if you can switch between these various types of systems then you have a lot more flexibility about how and when you play, especially as adults. You know, kids have way more time to play these games, typically. Not, not always. But instead of having an hour a week to play, you can have three or four, if you're not picking. Three or four, if that's what you want to do. And, and you can contribute to your game while you're waiting in line for a movie, or while you're at the DMV, or the laundromat. The sky's the limit. And this switching between these you know, mathematical systems or increasing or reducing them and switching between formats of you know, Facebook and in-person, which we didn't talk about quite as much in this episode. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly not going to appeal to all players and all gaming groups. It does add so much flexibility in how much you can play. 
So speaking of making the most of a little bit of time, let's talk about micro RPGs. Yeah. So micro RPGs, they're a good deal simpler and more open than even Fate. These are generally only a couple of pages long, and they don't tend to care about balance or realism. The goal is to get you and your friends role-playing like yesterday. And if you don't like a particular micro RPG, no harm, no foul. Seriously. Micro RPGs tend to be cheap. They come in packs. If you play one, you've only given 20 minutes, maybe an hour of your life. If you don't like it, scrap it. Try a different one. You've learned about something that you don't like. And that is also valuable. Yeah. So if you're working with a group that's unsure if they want to role play or not, micro RPGs are an excellent option. Like we said, these things are cheap to purchase. They jump straight to the action and they give you enough of a taste to see if this is something you want to explore. Generally, micro RPGs are fairly focused. The goal is to get you to practice a single mechanic or skill and have fun with that. In the same way that Improv games tend to double as crash courses in specific aspects of improv. Just like improv games, though, there's nothing that stops you from running with a particularly good one into this massive scene. And it can be wonderful when that happens. I mean, sometimes it crashes and burns. That's fine. You pick up, you learn something, you try again. But when an improv scene does flower into something where everyone can contribute and be involved, it's, I mean, it's beautiful. It's this type of collective performance art. It's why we play the game. That's why we play the game. I do want to say, like theater and like improv, leave them wanting more. I'm not sure that we've done that. Uh, maybe not. But regardless, there's way more to know about RPGs, both the ones we've talked about and the hundreds, if not thousands, that we have not mentioned in this episode. Mm -hmm. This was a taste, just the tiniest little tasting menu of the RPGs that are out there that are available to everyone. But either way... (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's it for us on this episode. (laughs) I'm sure we will talk about RPGs in a future episode of the Corex and Coffee cast, but... There's just so much. We'll find something else. There's so much. There's so much. Until that time, thank you so much for listening. You are why we do this. We love members of this community. We love being part of this community. That is why we do what we do. Please do like and subscribe, and do check out our website at coraxandcoffee.com. Please consider supporting us on Patreon or through our merch store. Whether you do or not, our content is free. I'm your host, Pete Steele. And I'm your other host, Rick Hendricks. And we really do hope to be seeing you at the gaming table soon. Until next time, take care. Take care, all. Bye. This is one of those episodes that really plays your hippocampus like a drum. You can almost smell the Cheetos that Travis brought and still can't figure out why no one will share their dice with him. Kevin's mom made him bring apples and bananas for snacks, which have their own staying power and do not mix well with cheddar powder and citric acid. Last week, it was tuna fish. Next week, it'll be egg salad. And me, my friend Tim picking me up early so we can get teriyaki from that weird strip mall by Travis and Michael's place. We skipped lunch working on these new characters for the adventure. And Michael has quite the dungeon he wants to run us all through. It would be really nice if we didn't have to work with brothers, because Travis made him angry and we had to all die as a... Well, anyway. The point is, RPGs are cool, and only the cool kids play them. Join us, won't you? This party consists of our two roguish types, Pete Steele and Rick Hendricks. The Bard going slowly insane while he flirts with a demon to multi-class warlock? That's Keegan King, baby. Thank you as well to all the people that help us make these episodes. You can think of them as being the parents upstairs who are unhappy with their kids being indoor kids. If this call to adventure is fun for you, seek out some of the insanity scrawled on dirty, forgotten scrolls at coraxandcopy.com. There you will find written game reviews, unboxing videos, and -and print-and-play games that are very different from D&D, and yet somehow eerily familiar. Follow us on social media, or follow our ravens, I guess. This metaphor is falling apart. But it would be awesome for you to subscribe, rate us, and give us some comments. We love it. The quote of the week. Blackmail is such an ugly word. I prefer extortion. The X makes it sound cool. Corax and Coffee. Tabletop gaming. Caffeinated.